Hi there, and welcome to, this should be what, week seven of, uh, of contemporary art. Today, uh, or this week, you're only going to have this one lecture on land art, and you've got a ton of stuff to read on land and environmental art for this week, and then the next lecture will be covering feminism uh, and the emergence of feminist art. The reason that these are starting to get lumped together is because the later 60s and the 70s see the introduction of several really influential political and social movements. In the case of land art, and these are of course also not in a vacuum, so I mean the land and environment and earth artists are very, very much steeped in what's come before them. So conceptual art, minimalism, all the philosophical questions that have been raised in the past decade or so are going to be kind of influential for the development of this particular style of art, which goes outside the gallery and into the land. Uh, but another factor to consider here is the emergence of uh, different political movements. In the case of the earth artists, it's the environmental movement that seems to have some, I mean, it, it coincides with the emergence of land art. Some famous Things, let's see, what, Earth Days founded in 72, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, published in 1963. This is a book that talked about the dangers of pesticides. Uh, you have the beginnings of the modern environmental movement in this period, and so you have the beginnings of this kind of new version of consciousness about the earth and the environment around us, and that seems to be another factor that influences the development of these kinds of landscape artists. And so that's what we're going to look at for today. Probably the first most famous of these pieces, or the, the first of these pieces that becomes famous is this piece out in the Nevada desert called Double Negative, which was created by Michael Heiser, who's still working today out in Nevada. This is a, his double negative cut into the uh, two trenches basically cut into the eastern edge of the Mormon Mesa in uh, Nevada between 1969-1970. The shape of the Mesa edge, if you looked at the Mesa, this flat top mountain from the um, from overhead, the edge of the the mountain or the Mesa has a kind of natural curve in it, so that the trench that Heiser dug, or actually had um, had dug commissioned, uh, you know, earth moving company to do the, the actual digging for him. The trenches line up across this, this U-shaped curve in the edge of the mesa. So it's a man-made intervention into the landscape. It's a giant sculpture that is also an absence, right? It's a cut into the earth. It is taking the idea of minimalism outside of the gallery and into the natural environment. So working with very basic forms, working with a very basic materials, creating uh, an experience, a visual and aesthetic experience. Michael Heiser said of himself one of the things he liked about this, he, he kind of talks about himself as a conceptual artist, not a minimalist, and he says, you know, what he liked about double negative is there is nothing there, but it is still a sculpture. It's a sculpture made out of air. It's a sculpture out of nothing. So the trenches together measure 1,500 feet long, 50 feet deep, 30 feet wide, and about 240,000 tons of rock were displaced to make uh, or to construct the two trenches. So this is your earliest example of earth art or land art that's actually done in the landscape. And I've got a few more views of double negative just to give you an overall sense of what this thing looks like. There, you can see that's the edge of the mesa. I was saying how there's this kind of U-shaped curve in the edge of the mesa. And then you can look from the one side of the double negative across to the other side. It's this kind of, you know, very simple intervention in the landscape that, um, Heiser has created here. Over time, the first picture, this picture I'm showing you is from about 1970, so you can see that it's very pristine looking cut into the landscape, very, very mathematically precise looking, and then the, the edges have gotten a little more ragged, some stone has fallen in, it has started to erode a little bit. This is one of the things that land artists work with, or earthworks artists like to work with, is this idea of change over time, of the inevitable, inexorable retaking of the land by nature, um, or this idea of entropy, you know, 
change and de decay and deterioration on such a large scale that, of course, it takes millennia for it to happen. Heiser said about this, not only that, you know, there's nothing there yet, it is still a sculpture, but he also said, he also said, um, you know, these are works of art that can be considered works of art. They don't have to be in the Metropolitan Museum for you to go see them. And as long as you're going to make a sculpture, why not make one that competes with the 747 or the Empire State Building? So, in other words, if you're going to go, go big, right? And then see what happens to the landscape over time. Here's another view, a more recent view of double negative. So you can see how it is starting to erode away. The corners aren't quite as pristine as they used to be. And then you can also see this is standing at the top of the trench and looking across it. One of the other aspects of land art that is a common theme is this idea that you have to go and experience it and that it's different depending on when you're there, what the weather's like, what the light is like, that it is a constantly changing and constantly evolving work of art. And that is something that comes a little bit from the earlier work of people like John Cage. Remember, they're incorporating chants, they're incorporating what's in the natural surroundings of a concert hall into the eventual creation of a piece of music. Same thing kind of is going on here. This idea that you, that it, art is not separate from the rest of life and that it is incorporating and using and altering what's already there and interacting with it. So here's some really nice recent pictures of double negative and I like this because these are very, you know, arty, obviously, photography fo uh, or photo artist types of photos of double negative. So a different time of day, different lighting conditions to see it looking sort of, I don't know, dare I say it, a little bit sexy, right? Like a little postcard view of double negative there. And that's, uh, so that's the first one of these pieces. Michael Heiser initiates the, I mean, he gets credited with initiating this whole movement, although other people are thinking about the same ideas and working on this stuff at the same time. Heiser continued to work as a landscape artist or as an earthworks artist. In the 1980s, he was commissioned to create this set of landscape um, constructions known as the effigy tumuli. These are in Buffalo Rock State Park in Illinois, and they are on the site of a former mine as, a convert, as part of converting the mine, the kind of strip-mined landscape, into a usable park site. Heiser was hired to take some of that barren land and do something with it, create some sort of um, monument that would, would make it, you know, would, would transform the kind of ugliness of the strip mine landscape. So he did a series of basically giant mounds of earth that are representing geometrically abstracted animals. Each of the animals chosen because they were indigenous to the region. So I'm not showing you all of them, but there was a catfish, a water strider, which is this figure right here, a frog, a turtle, and a snake. So here again, working with the land, doing the, the mo earth or monumental sort of intervention in the landscape, here actually making something somewhat representational and and corresponding to the natural forms of the area. And here, meant to basically reclaim an abandoned mine site and turn it into something that was, again, usable for humans. He seems to have been partly inspired by the tomb or the mound builders that are indigenous to the Midwest. The mound builders, the most famous of these mounds is the Great Serpent Mound in southwestern Ohio, kind of close to Cincinnati. It comes from a culture that the dating of the mounds has been kind of controversial, but probably the most recent guesstimates on dating or estimates on dating are somewhere between 1000 and 1200 AD. These giant monumental earthwork sculptures created by Native American population to probably um, represent a kind of cosmological symbol that is a symbol that corresponded between and um, actually communicated between the earth and the heavens. Here's just the map of the effigy tumuli sculpture there at the, that's actually at the um, um, state park at Buffalo Rock. So you can see there's the water strider I was just showing you, and uh, there's a frog, and then the catfish, um, 
clearly marked out on this plot of land. There on the right is just another picture of the water strider. And this is a more recent picture, so you can see how over time grass has grown and things like that. And then there's the frog right behind the water strider in this um, in the landscape. And of course, the effigy tumuli are different depending on whether you're flying over them in a helicopter or actually walking up to look at them or walk up them. So this is a just a detail of the water strider. So you can see from up close, it really just looks like a nice rise in the landscape. So you have to be overhead to see it in its full glory. And this is the Great Serpent Mound I was just mentioning. This is one of his direct inspirations. And actually, another Earth artist that we're going to look at from this time period, Robert Smithson, was also directly inspired by this Great Serpent Mound. Just keep that spirally-looking tail on the left side of the screen in the back of your mind for when we look at Robert Smithson. So Michael Heiser, in the case of the effigy tumuli, was really kind of drawing on can, uh, the people of his era had also kind of developed romanticized ideas about Native American relations to the landscape. And so uh, kind of adopting the modus operandi of those earlier mound builder cultures to make these monumental sculptures outdoors, trying to tie himself to a natural tradition and an American tradition and make these kind of grand scale statements. Uh, Heiser also bought some land in the early 70s and began a gigantic earth moving project which has continued to the present. He's very secretive about it. He doesn't let people come visit it. It is a kind of project that he ha seems to be doing for himself. He gets funding from a couple of organizations that are big into the support of land and environmental art. But this highlights actually something that has been a little bit controversial about this type of art. The two foundations are the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, which has bought the land that Double Negative is in, so it technically it owns Double Negative. It's part of its collection. But of course, you can't really see it unless you take a four-wheel G or like a four-wheel drive <laughs> trip into the desert to go see Double Negative. So it's very inaccessible. Right. Same thing with city. City has the location is kept fairly well hidden. Heiser does not allow visitors. He doesn't allow photographs. So we have very limited information about what it is. This is one of few photographs that we have of it, where you can see that it's a giant construction that looks a little bit like it's reminiscent of the pyramids of Egypt or the pyramids of Teotihuacan in uh, Mexico. It's reminiscent of the ziggurat temple platforms of the ancient Near East. All these building structures through human history where humans have tried to build platforms that help them to communicate with the heavens. So there's a kind of mystical tradition that's going on here that he's co-opting or, or tapping into. Uh, this idea of these monumental things that can help you get into touch with something greater than yourself. Um, also part of the land and environmental art movement. This is another one of the few views we have of his ongoing project. This is part of City, a series of wedge shapes. And again, this is the kind of thing that is very simple and almost universal. So it seems to have references to ancient Egypt or to um, Aztec culture or to ancient Near Eastern culture or the temples at Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Um, really. Uh, referencing in a very basic way other giant monumental projects that have been created by man over time. Let's see, I'm looking for measurements. Yeah, these are, um, the complexes are typically 70 to 80 feet in height. And um, I'm looking, I don't have the yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the footprint of the uh, number of acres here. Uh, anyway, so you're not allowed to go see it. It's funded by a different um, organization. It's funded partly by a woman named Virginia Dwan, D-W-A-N, who was a pay, or is a patron, a gallery owner who is a patron of these land artists, and then partly funded by DIA, which is an, a, an arts organization that owns a couple of major earthworks sites and supports a lot of earthworks artists. 
Dia strictly controls access to other earthwork sites that they own. And so this is part of the kind of criticism of land art is that although it's meant to be this kind of spiritual experience that gets you in touch with the land, that it's very hard to get to these projects. And they also were, all these artists were talking about how art shouldn't just be in museums. Art shouldn't just be for people in galleries. Art should be for everybody. It should be monumental, et cetera, et cetera. But it's really hard to say this is art for everybody when nobody can go see um, the city project, when very few people in a season are allowed to go visit the lightning field of Walter DeMaria. So, you know, it's a criticism of this kind of, of project. But it has its roots in a desire to expand the walls of the gallery, uh, to connect with the land, to create these kind of constructs that would harken back to ancient times, creating a sense of awe in the viewer. In fact, that's one of the things that uh, one of the things that Heiser has said. He says, it is interesting to build a sculpture that attempts to create an atmosphere of awe. Small works are said to do this, but it is not my experience. Immense architecturally sized sculpture creates both the object and the atmosphere. Awe is a state of mind equivalent to religious experience. I think if people feel commitment, they feel something has been transcended. I think that large sculptures produced in the 60s and 70s by a number of artists were reminiscent of the time when societies were committed to the construction of massive, significant works of art. So that's Heiser's position on this, is that this is the kind of thing he's making is something to inspire a sort of quasi-religious experience in you. And again, coming at a time when there's renewed interest in Native American traditions and when there's renewed interest in the land itself, um, that is part of the part of the background in which land and environment art emerges. Probably another one of the most famous of the earthworks art pieces is this piece by Robert Smithson that was finished in 1970. It is a jetty in the shape of a spiral. That is, it is a man-made construction, a rock wall that, that juts out into the Salt Lake, um, here, and it's on the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Another fairly inaccessible place. So Smithson started out as a minimalist, but um, got interested in this whole idea of land art, took a trip out into the Yucatan in South America, and had this kind of conversion experience where he realized that people needed to have more of a, com a communion with nature. So over the course of six days in April 1970, Smithson and two assistants used some dump trucks, a front loader, and a tractor to move about 7,000 tons of earth and rock from nearby hillsides into the lake in the shape of this spiral. The jetty is a road 15 feet wide and 1,500 feet long um, coiled into the spiral. So this is what it looked like about 1970. And I've got a couple of other views of it to give you a sense of how it looks at different times. There is a nice kind of canonical view from the shoreline out into the jetty of Spiral Jetty. There on the right is another view of the spiral where, again, Smithson, like Heiser, was directly inspired by things like the Great Serpent Mound, and that spiral seems to be quoting the tail of the Great Serpent Mound back in Ohio. It's also a very basic shape. It's a very minimalist type of shape, and it echoes the idea of swirling and eddying waters, so it's particularly appropriate to the site that it's in. And it has this kind of interesting interaction with its environment. Here on the right, you can see how the interior of the spiral gets pinker and pinker. That's because the water in there gets uh, more and more stagnant and created a good environment for a particular kind of algae to form and grow. So it alters the water uh, environment there and creates new aesthetic effects. Since 1970, the water table has risen at the, or the water level has risen at the Great Salt Lake, so that for parts of the year, the entire spiral uh, jetty surface is underwater, up to a couple of feet underwater, so that it's not always visible anymore. Smithson himself was okay with this idea that eventually spiral jetty would be eroded or would be covered or would be obliterated by time and by nature and by the forces of entropy or decay and change. 
So this was built into the sculpture or meant to be part of the sculpture. Here is a view of salt covering the spiral of spiral jetty. Or actually, no, I'm sorry, this is um, wintertime, so snow accumulating on top of spiral jetty so that it looks different again at different times of the year, just like other earthworks art. It is incorporating and playing with the idea of change over time and the randomness of the environment kind of generating the look of the sculpture. And here are salt crystals forming at a different time of year on top of spiral jetty so that it gets this kind of bearded frosted look when it's above ground or above the water level. There's also, by the way, uh, a reading this week about going to experience spiral jetty in person and then a little clip of Smithson talking about the um, spiral jetty so for you to look at on Blackboard. Okay, so those are two of the canonical pieces or canonical artists, Heiser and Smithson. Smithson, by the way, died shortly after Spiral Jetty was completed. He was scouting out a location via helicopter for a sculpture he was going to do in Amarillo, Texas, and the helicopter crashed and it killed him and the pilot. So he died um, tragically young after just completing a few of these major projects which have become really influential in art history. Another one of these artists, and we're not going to talk about every single land artist, but I just want to give you a sampling so that you have some idea of, of the philosophy and then some of the main uh, pieces that come out of this movement. This is Walter de Maria, who, again, like these other land artists, grows out of a minimalist tradition to become a land intervention artist. Here is his earth room at the Dia Foundation from 1968. So this is actually in the gallery, of the Dia Gallery in New York. And there's a little film about 20 seconds long of somebody visiting there recently so you can get a sense of, you know, the space that this thing is in. This is a series of rooms in a gallery filled with earth to a depth of about two feet. You can't actually walk into it. It's actually um, cordoned off with plexiglass in the entry to the gallery up to about the level of two feet to keep the dirt inside the gallery. Um, Demaria's earth room was meant to bring the outdoors in and meant to be a sensory, a complete and total sensory experience. So here you are in the gallery and it's the subject of the work is the experience of smelling and seeing the earth itself. And you know if you've ever gardened you know that rich earth gives off a little bit of heat you know because of the constant decay and composting that's going on so you'd have that rich loamy earthy smell you'd have the risen humidity and temperature inside the gallery area where the dirt is and you'd have that kind of heat being given off by the the dirt itself so very simple very elemental a lot like minimalist art but here instead of using the basic shape of the cube or something like that we're using a very basic material and here again just as artists have been doing for the last 15 years or so he's taking traditionally non uh, art materials and making them into the subjects of art so you could think of the arte povera movement you could think of um, robert rauschenberg there's a whole bunch of different ways in which people have been doing this and walter de maria has become part of that continuum Damari is probably most famous, however, for this piece known as the Lightning Field. The Lightning Field, which is in uh, New Mexico. Let's see. The Lightning Field dates to 1977 in New Mexico. It is a series of 400 stainless steel poles arrayed in a grid by 25 by 16, um, uh, 25 poles by 16 poles, covering an area of about a mile square. The tops of the poles are all at the same level. Now that, you've got to think about that, that's kind of an engineering feat. So if you were to take a giant sheet of paper, you could lay it across the top of the poles and it would be completely even and completely flat. That means every individual pole had to be cut to a particular length so that they would all reach exactly the same point or the, exactly the same height in space. Okay, um, so the poles average a height of about 20 feet, give or take, depending on how much of a rise in the ground there is at the particular place where they're inserted. This, pl this field then was basically designed to be um, 
designed to be an outdoor sculpture that would change over time and that would would create visual spectacles by being struck by lightning during lightning storms. It's an open, flat area. It has very little population right here in New Mexico. And it was a good place. It's a, it happens to be a part of New Mexico where there are lots of thunderstorms during, um, during especially the spring. With the idea then that this would be a kind of, you know, sculpture waiting to happen so that whenever lightning would strike then it would create these you know one of these aluminum poles it would create a, 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 a momentary spectacle so i think you can see where there's all kinds of the issues of conceptual and even performance art and um, minimalism all being brought to bear in this sculpture which is just on a massive ginormous scale so that you can't possibly as a human being take it all in at once you can't see the whole mile square of these poles you can't always see the lightning striking um, you know it's a it's a massive constantly changing installation um, dealing with weather and light it's a sculpture you can walk in you can fly over you can you know sit in the little cabin that the Dia Foundation owns and watch through binoculars, uh, a bunch of different ways in which you can experience the lightning field. Dia, the organization that owns lightning field, actually only allows visitors between May and October. It's not, um, it's not allowed to view it or visit it during the winter months which is interesting, um, partly because of, you know, inaccessibility and, and weather conditions, and partly um, um, just to control access. Let me show you a few more views of Lightning Field so you can see how it looks different depending on where you're standing and what the weather conditions are like. So here's another nice, gorgeous view of the Lightning Field with those aluminum poles glinting in the evening sun. Here's Lightning Field as it was meant to be originally uh, experienced with lightning striking some of the poles. This incidentally happens to be a pretty rare event in the history of lightning field. There haven't been that many lightning strikes here. There haven't, I mean, in a year there aren't that many lightning strikes that hit the lightning field. So you don't get to see it in the way DeMaria originally conceived it very often. Oh, I guess I only had that one more slide. So uh, that's about all I have to say about Walter DeMaria's lightning field. You can also read about Roden Crater, uh, James Turrell's Roden Crater. There's a little bit about that in the David Hopkins book. And then there's a lot of stuff to read this week about land art and the emergence of land art in the 60s and 70s. I have one more artist to show you before we wrap up for this lecture for this week. And that is an English artist named Richard Long, who is also going to start working out directly in the landscape with this idea of time and change and the temporariness of human intervention in the land. This is his line made by walking from 1967 and that quite literally is quite literally that is Richard Long pacing back and forth across this field until he had mashed down the grass enough to create a visible line in the grass and then he took a photograph of it and the photograph is really all that remains. Obviously it wouldn't take too long for the grass to perk back up, you know, a couple of rainstorms, a couple of mowings, and then there would be no trace of Richard Long ever having been there. Uh, Long, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Long's work is really all about this relationship between the man uh, or humankind and nature and the idea of the temporariness of the human intervention in the landscape. Long really works almost like a conceptual artist, so it's really the idea of what he's doing that is important more than the actual product itself. Here he continued in this vein where he would be he would conduct walks and sometimes very long walks. Here is his line in the Himalayas made by walking um, across this this part of the the mountain range of the Himalayas he did walks or actually he's still around he continues to do this kind of stuff where he'll take a walk from one place to another lately he has stopped even documenting them with photographs so that the um, only record of his walks or his interventions in the land are the notes that he takes and so an even more recent piece here from 1980 the five-day walk just basically is a description 
of a walk that he took in 1980. So, From One Town to Another in England by Roads and Lanes in 1980. And he just here documents the number of miles that he walked each day. So there's no map, there's no picture, there's no other record. It's simply the act of walking itself that has become his, um, has become his piece. It's the concept, it's the idea. So, and that's an important thing to, I wanted to point out just because I think all of these Earthworks artists have a very strong conceptual streak to them, uh, especially because in most of these cases it's very difficult to access or see the work that they created except in photographs and a lot of what is important is something that you can't really contain in a photograph. Walter DeMaria actually said Lightning Field isn't really represented by photographs. The only way to get it is to go there and experience it and uh, to, to really feel it and to kind of uh, mentally grasp it while you're there. So concept is very important to these guys. And then finally, you can pause this page if you want. A couple of terms or people or concepts that you should be familiar with, and you will get more information about these, the Dia Foundation and LACMA in the readings that you do as well, as far as what they are um, all about and how they're related to land art and why they're controversial. So that's all I'm going to say on land art for this week. You have plenty of reading to do on it, and I will see you next time. We'll be talking about other manifestations of politics in the arts in the 70s, and that is with the um, next time it'll be feminism. So I'll see you then.